Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar on the unprecedented new findings on Jews with disabilities. What does it mean for the future? Today, we will have exclusive presentations and facilitated discussion as we dive into the results of three major new studies on Jewish disability inclusion in the workforce. We will discuss successful models from Jewish human service agencies for increasing employment for people with disabilities. We will hear what Leading Edge has learned about Jews and others with disabilities who work at Jewish organizations and where progress has been made. And we'll have findings from Respectability's major study on the inclusion of Jews with disabilities inside Jewish groups. We will also mention some big picture takeaways on where we can go from here so that Jews and others with disabilities can thrive both inside and outside of Jewish institutions. And now I want to um, hand it over to Jennifer Mizrahi from Ms. Respectabilities to get us started today. And I also wanna thank her to, uh, for being the generous sponsor of this event. It's made possible by the Mizrahi Family Charitable Fund in honor, in honor of Respectability. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Tamara. And I just wanna give a huge shout out to the Jewish Funders Network. I've been a proud member for 21 years. My husband and I started immediately when we created our donor advice fund when we got married. And everything about the organization is fabulous because of this opportunity of partnering with peers. All of the work that we're about to hear is really a result of partnership and collaboration. If you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go with each other. Each of these organizations we're gonna hear with is a model partner for everyone in the Jewish community. I had the great privilege of starting to work in disability because I was at a Jewish Funders Network conference when I heard Joan Alexander and Linda Lay Berger speak in Houston, Texas and the amazing work that they were doing many years ago ahead of everyone else inspired me as to what was possible for the Jewish world globally. I'm very honored to work on these issues with yeah. Judith Creed, with Vivian Bass, with Shelley Cohen, with the Einstein Sims families and so many others, and to have the support of the Schusterman family and the, yeah. um, the Jewish Community Foundation in Greater Los Angeles yeah. and so many other partners. Yeah. I'm gonna turn it over to Matan Koch. Matan Koch is a wonderful Jewish leader. He um, is the leader of Respectability's um, Jewish work. He's also um, the vice president president of respectability. Um, you can't see it, but he is quadriplegic and went to Yale when he was like 16, went to Harvard Law School where he's at like the top of his class and was Senate confirmed for working in the Obama administration before he even hit age 30. And congratulations to him for hitting age 40 uh, this week. So now you could go study Kabbalah if you want, um, but we're gonna instead have you moderate this amazing session with these speakers. So Matan Koch, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and for that wonderful introduction. Spare me my blushes. We'll jump right over me, therefore, and introduce you to our fantastic panelists. Uh, we first have, and our first presenter will be Golly Cooks, the CEO of Leading Edge. Uh, our next presenter will be Megan Buren of uh, Buren Research and Communications, but also a longtime pollster for respectability who's been helping us track data trends since the beginning. And also uh, our fantastic partner, Ruben Rotman, who is the CEO of the Network of Jewish Human Service Agencies of which respectability is a proud member. Uh, so you really came to hear and then you didn't come to hear from me. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Gali with thanks to the Jewish Funders Network for this opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you, Matan. And thank you, Jennifer and the respectability team and JFN. We are very excited to be participating in this conversation. And our research would not have been and come to be were it not for Jennifer and Matan 
working with us on crafting questions as we went out and wanted to get employee experience information from folks. So I, I really appreciate it. And hopefully what we're about to share will be able to uh, add to the conversation and uh, big, deliver a picture of what's going on. Uh, so Eric, I wonder if you might be able to uh, share the screen. Um, I, have a, I have a short presentation since this is, uh, we would like to share the results of, uh, for the first time, a snapshot of what the experience of employees working in Jewish organizations um, is like for those employees who disclose and, and had that they have a disability. Um, next slide, please, Eric. So before we jump in, part of why we want to hear from employees is because the real purpose of Leading Edge is to create an ecosystem of Jewish organizations that are healthy, that are adaptive, that are high performing, that are contributing to society in a way that we need them to. Next slide, please. And the way that we do that is really in a three-pronged uh, approach. One is by supporting senior leadership as they try to lead change. The rest, uh, the next one is board leadership as the board and professional uh, partnership is key to a healthy nonprofit. And the third has to do with workplace culture. And this is the area where we end up uh, interfacing with a lot of employees, asking them for information. And this is uh, really the stream of work that gave rise to uh, the survey uh, and the results that we're about to share. Next slide, please. So every year, uh, apart from 2020, we have done since 2016, an employee experience survey in partnership with, uh, with a partner named Culture Amp. Um, this is a, uh, an online 92 question, uh, a survey of employees at Jewish organization really to tease out employees experience at work. So the day to day, and the idea is that an employee that is connected to their work and with a whole of other, a whole other, a lot of other factors is going to be able to contribute to the bottom line, the triple bottom line of an organization. So this year you can see we had 221 organizations participate, um, about 11,613, love that number, uh, responded. Um, and so we're going to be, uh, we're going to be sharing uh, what, what we heard. Next slide, please. And just to give you uh, uh, some context, we are gonna be releasing as we have in years past on November 30th, so just in a couple of weeks, a more robust and complete report of our findings. But this year's survey, as in others, uh, breaks down those 92 questions into different factors that are like different categories of an employee experience. All of them really are, are the ones that enable people to be their best and maximize their potential at work. So just a little bit behind, um, behind the curtain of, of this survey tool. Next slide, please. So let's, let's, um, let's shine a light on those employees uh, with disabilities in the Jewish workplace. Next slide, please. So we're gonna, we're gonna get at it. Um, as I mentioned, 11,613 employees uh, answered our survey this year. Um, of those 848 answered yes to the question over here, which is, do you have a disability, either physical, emotional, mental, hearing, visual, et cetera, that impacts daily living? So that's 848, about 7%. Uh, the rest, 84% said no, um, some preferred not to answer, um, and some uh, preferred not to self-identify as well. Uh, but there's, a, there's a meaningful data set here uh, that from here, uh, the, the following slides will really unpack those employees' uh, experience at work. I do just want to qualify what we're about to share in that this, the 221 organizations who took our survey this year, it is not a representative sample of our entire sector. So it's a, it's a nice sample size. And especially when you think of different, uh, different percentages of the workforce, but just wanna qualify that. Um, and this is the first year that we did it, like I mentioned, because of Jennifer and Matan and, and respectability. So we're looking forward to you know, compounding data and seeing what the trend lines are uh, moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. So of the 848 who said, yes, I have a disability of some kind, um, the follow-up question was, well, how does your organization meet that? And um, so about half agreed that my organization provides the necessary accommodation 
that enable me to succeed in, in my work. And this was, this was interesting to us. It's sort of good news, bad news, because it means that one out of every two folks who said that I have a disability um, is actually not being accommodated. So, you know, there's some, there's some room for growth there. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I, I want to give a, a bit of a, a picture of how are folks who, uh, who have a disability, how they compare with those who don't and, and the aggregate. And you can see here that in terms of job level, these folks are overwhelmingly individual contributors, meaning they don't manage anyone. Um, and these tend to be, you know, if we're looking at the hierarchy of an organization, um, they're generally at the, at the bottom of that hierarchy in terms of um, being an individual contributor in the job level. Next slide, please. We also see from an age perspective, I know this is somewhat small, but just follow the red line. That's, that's the folks who said um, people with disabilities, um, they're overwhelmingly under 40. And, and that means that, you know, the millennial wave is certainly here. And, and you can see that in some ways, um, the red line here is people with disabilities, the yellow is people without disabilities. And you can see that in, in many ways, um, the folks with disabilities who are under 40 are, are over uh, representative if we look at the trend line um, in terms of the aggregate. Um, so just really interesting to, to note that as well. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of salary level, this is even you know smaller print, but the news here is the salary trend curve actually uh, does does align when you look with uh, folks with disabilities and without. Uh, but overwhelmingly, we're talking about folks who make under sixty thousand dollars a year. Um, that's the vast majority. It makes sense to some extent because we're talking about again folks who are at the job level of an independent contributor. Um, next slide, please. So. Now we wanna get at some of the qualitative aspects of people's experience at work. And overwhelmingly what organizational development psychologists will say, employee engagement is the biggest indicator of a, a person's ability to really maximize their potential and be the best employee they can be, honestly, at work. And employee engagement means I'm connected to the mission. I, I understand what I do. Uh, I appreciate my manager for who they are. And I would recommend my organization as a great place to work um, and would recommend that to a friend like the net promoter score. So there's a lot here. And, and again, when we release the, the report, um, there's going to be a lot to unpack. But one of the things that we were interested about is how on these engagement factor, uh, employee engagement factor questions, and there are four key questions that really drive everything else. How do people with disabilities compare to those uh, without and, and the aggregate? And it looks like there's quite a big gap, in fact, in this, um, in this data set. So you see that for our purposes, anything that is about 5% gap plus or minus is material. Um, so you can see in the four uh, engagement scores, there's um, overall, there's about a 7% gap, which means that employees with disabilities are less engaged at work than the aggregate and those without disabilities. Um, and that's, that's a pretty material and somewhat dramatic gap um, that, is, uh, that is worth noting. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to, to also unpack, remember there are 13 different factors and some of them are really interesting to see um, where are the biggest gaps again between those folks who say I have a disability and those who do not and then just the aggregate. Um, and so these, these questions are actually the ones with the, the largest gaps. Um, and you can see a lot of them have to do with employee enablement, which very, very simply is a person's ability to do their work. And that can literally mean I have the hardware I need in order to do my data processing. I mean, it's, it's a very straightforward kind of, um, kind of uh, metric. Um, and it also means capacity. So it, you see that these are um, on the left side here, we've got factor, we've got the question in the middle here, and then you see the gap. Um, and there are, there's a trend here of folks, um, again, not uh, those with disabilities really having a gap between, uh, you know, the more the trend line of the norm um, of the employees that we saw, and that falls under employee enablement, which again is is pretty um, is pretty predominant here. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, just a, a couple of, of last slides on really drilling down into some of these big gap areas and again, unpacking another, another layer. Employee enablement, like I said, is your ability to actually do your work in a very concrete, uh, concrete way. Um, here, we, these are all the questions that feed into this factor in the survey. And you can see that there are, uh, there are significant gaps of employees with disabilities and those um, who do not have disabilities around systems and processes, access to information, resources, and workloads. Um, and these are, are very much, um, again, all feed into an overarching experience at work that is notable. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing that we see, uh, especially I would say in light of the pandemic, is employees are craving a, a, a workplace where they can really bring their whole selves. And there are many different factors that have little nuggets of this. Overall, that ability to really be yourself and to trust and be trusted is under the umbrella of psychological safety. And what we see here again is when we do a side-by-side -side comparison of those employees with disabilities and without, um, there is a material gap here about a person with disabilities and employee being able to bring their home self and be able to feel comfortable sharing potentially unpopular opinions or uh, feeling like they're going to be heard in some way. Um, and it's been, it's been shown that psychological safety is really a critical driver for retention um, and, and uh, ability to really um, enable employees to grow in their work. Uh, next slide, and we're almost at the end here. Um, the, the other one that you know, was really interesting to, for us to look at is around learning and advancement where you know, we have a bunch of, uh, you know, in some ways, entry level, you know, low job level um, employees with disabilities. So what is that experience like as we think of you know, where they wanna be in the next two to three years and where that growth potential is? And here actually there is less of a difference than some of the others. There's still a gap um, in that there doesn't seem to be sufficient opportunities for professional development for these employees as compared with those without disabilities. Um, they're maybe not given as challenging or interesting work. So their day to day might not be as interesting, um, but it does seem like there's there are opportunities for advancement and some mobility there, which is which is really um, encouraging. Uh, next slide, please. This is really the, the, the final of it. I just wanted to give a little voice to some of the 848 uh, folks with disabilities. And here too, it's really, um, it's kind of a, a mixed, uh, mixed experience as, as all work experiences are. Uh, we heard a lot of comments throughout the, throughout the survey, and I just wanted to tease out a couple. You know, for some, uh, it's certain that their, their workplaces are giving them signals like, no, actually, I see that you have a disability. We can't accommodate you based on your job. Um, for others, they don't feel psychologically safe, it sounds like, to, um, to disclose what is an invisible disability. And still others, it seems like, are, are really embraced and, and able to do uh, their work in a way that really brings their whole self. And uh, uh, that really completes in some way the, the, our snapshot of employees with disabilities and their day-to-day -day experience at Jewish organizations uh, based on the survey that we just completed. So Matan, back, back to you and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dolly. That was really interesting uh, and really food for thought. And I'm excited that we're gonna get into it for discussion. Um, before I turn things over to Megan, uh, Megan has asked that I give a brief uh, introduction to uh, respectability to the organization that I work for that uh, sponsored her survey, and we are an organization and a nonprofit that fights stigmas and advances opportunities so that people with disabilities can be included in all aspects of society. We were founded on Jewish values. We base all of our work in those values. And while we have found, and this study bears out, that issues of employment and economic security are perhaps first and foremost, even in the minds of Jews with disabilities. We also collaborate with organizations throughout the Jewish world and beyond to make sure that uh, folks can participate uh, in their faith communities, especially within the Jewish community. Um, and we did this study because we only know how to target that work 
if we periodically check in and see how it's going, how are we doing, where do we need to refocus our efforts. So we're really excited that Megan is going to share some of that with you now. And Megan, I turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. And Eric, if you want to go ahead and pull up the slides, thank you. As, um, as Matan mentioned and Jennifer mentioned, I have worked with respectability now for many years and was also active in, in um, facilitating training for synagogue inclusion over the years through respectability. And so these results were very exciting to see because respectability and other groups have been working so diligently for so many years. And it is very encouraging to see these trend lines move in the right direction towards demonstrating that there is growth in inclusion of people with disabilities in the Jewish community. So I appreciate the opportunity to share that good news and also to discuss what the poll demonstrated as areas where we still have room for growth. So like I said, the trend lines are heading in the right direction, but there are, there are di measurable differences between people with disabilities and people who do not have a disability connection. And that's helpful and instructive as the community continues to do that important work. Next slide, please. This survey was conducted in October. We reached out online and through the help of our partners and different outlets online. So similar to what Gali said, we have a really good sample here and we can learn information from seeing the differences within a sample of over 2,300 Jews, but it is not a random sample representative of all Jews across the United States. Next slide. This is the breakdown of the Jewish respondents. So 646 people who identify as being a person with a disability, and you'll see our shortcut there, PWD. 1,477 are people who identify as being in the disability community. So they have a close personal friend, family member, are an unpaid caregiver, a regular volunteer in the disability community. And there is overlap there. So there are 336 people who are both a person with a disability and someone who is counted within that community. And lastly, 534 who say that they have no disability connection. And you can see the breakdown underneath that among denomination of Jews. Next slide. This is the breakdown of within those people with a disability, what, um, what disability they have. And one thing that I think is important to note is there are a large number of people identified here as having a non-visible disability, which aligns and, um, and helps us to learn even more from the study that Gali just referenced, because we're seeing these kinds of numbers and she's seeing very larger numbers than one might have expected in terms of people who are employed in the Jewish community with a disability. And so we are definitely seeing that there are people with non-visible -vis disabilities who may not be comfortable disclosing in the workplace, even if they are disclosing online in the survey. Next slide. All right. So Compared to five years ago, and I'll say this is a question where we asked it in 2018 and in 2021, compared to five years ago, how is the Jewish community at including people with disabilities? So the good news, right, by 65 to one, people feel that things are better. We joked in looking at this data that we have 0.19% as much worse and 1% as somewhat worse that tracks to about four to seven people, which in our community, you know, there are more people complaining about Kiddush than are saying that we are somewhat worse or much worse than five years ago. And so those are meaningful and important results to see that trend. We saw that in 2018 as well, that things were heading in the right direction. But even from 2018, what you see in the change is an increase 
of people that feel that the community is doing better, including people with disabilities. And interestingly, and you'll see this throughout, there is a decrease in the people that say, I don't know. And so the efforts of the advocacy community and the work that people are doing is showing that more people with and without a disability in the community, not in the community, overall are hearing more about disability inclusion, right? So we're raising awareness as those don't know numbers decrease, which is one of the first steps towards making the type of changes and differences that we need to see. Next slide. This is one of those areas, though, where you see that the intensity level is different between people with a disability and people without a disability connection. So how well is, is the Jewish community doing and in including people with disabilities in synagogues, Jewish organizations, and communal activities? 14% of people without a connection will say extremely well, right? 23% very well. Whereas people with disabilities, you're only seeing 7% at extremely well and 18% very well. So the numbers overall are strong, but those type of differences demonstrate that the people who are personally impacted still don't feel that we are doing as well as the people who do not have a connection to disability. Next slide, please. One of the reasons that um, one could conclude from this data that things are going better is the training and the awareness that's happening around diversity inclusion in general. And so we asked, has the leadership of the faith organization you most closely align with made a specific commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion that has been made public to management, staff, stakeholders, and the public? And that's important, right? It's not just we put it on a website somewhere and we didn't talk about it again, or it's, you know, it's in a, it's, it's in the mission subsection 27, but we didn't really talk about it or share it. It's not just the words, it's the action behind it. So we've seen first that 57%, right, a strong majority are, and there's a lot of people that don't know. And then if you can go to the next slide, within that, if, their group has made a commitment, 88%, fully 88% of those have named disability as one of those areas. And that's an important distinction that we did not necessarily see in the past. It's a new question, so I can't track it to 2018, but we know from the synagogue work that we have done, that respectability has done and others, that there was a push to put disability into this group to make sure that inclusion efforts included disability training as well. And so these are important numbers. Next slide, please. The barriers, right, to more full inclusion of people with disabilities are almost identical to 2018. And the top choice is there's prejudice and unacknowledged stigma against people with disabilities. That's the top choice, whether it is um, people with disabilities, you can see that um, people without a connection are lower. But in addition, the other piece to note, we kept these the same as 2018, but there's a combination that could be made between the two that are highlighted, and I'll read them out. Religious leaders and activists want to be inclusive, but they don't know how, right? That's the more, um, that's the more forgiving, right, response of, we'd really like to do this, but we just don't have the training. And you can still see that those are high numbers, right? There's, that is, that is low hanging fruit, if you will, of people want to do this and just need the resources and the training in order to do it. And the other one takes a slightly more pessimistic um, or negative slant at, including people with disabilities can be complicated and we, we don't have the expertise to serve every need, which is, um, I think has the more negative slant and says, you know, underlying potentially, that's not something we're gonna be able to do. But the combination of both of those of, it's tough and we don't really know how, are very high numbers. And those, like I said, are potential low hanging fruit for us as 
ways to knock down some of those barriers. Next slide. One of the um, one of the things that we do and did in crafting this survey was reached out to lots of partners to find out what they wanted to know and what we should add from the 2018 survey. And one of the things was we want to know where where are the where are the good opportunities, right? Where are the success stories that have been happening in the community? And so we we changed this question slightly and ask not only about where are their challenges, but also where do you find the most access? And interestingly, we have a tale of two synagogues, right? So in some places we're finding 21%, this is the, the most access is I see it in synagogues. Whereas you see fully 18% saying that that is the largest challenge. And so we have definitely some shining examples of success in certain synagogues and others that are a continuous challenge for access and inclusion. Next slide, please. One of the areas, and we talked about this earlier, where people just don't necessarily know that there are clergy or staff with disabilities at their own faith-based institutions, there is an increase, a meaningful increase, from 13% to 20% that say, yes, they do know someone at their own faith-based institution, but we still have obviously considerable room for improvement in demonstrating that there are people with disabilities in real meaningful leadership roles. Next slide. And we have a, a too low of, um, in my opinion, too low of a response of yes in, people with disabilities being encouraged to serve on boards and committees at their faith-based institutions, which funnels into that question about leadership that you just saw. So only 15% saying that they feel that people are encouraged to do that and fully 26% saying no. Next slide. As I stated, the overall numbers in a lot of ways are very encouraging that the trends are happening in the right direction. But when we ask, have you or another person with a disability in your household ever been turned away from an activity, an organization in your faith community because of its inability or unwillingness to make a reasonable accommodation of the folks that identified as a person with a disability on the survey, fully 22% of them responded yes. Next slide. And they are deeply painful experiences. We have in the data that we released or that we are releasing following this, the open-ended responses, but people that were turned away from schools, people that didn't feel that they could be included in, um, in congregants or in, or in um, social situations online being, um, captions and other things being considered optional and nice to have, but not essential when it is essential for some people in order to be able to participate. Next slide. Right. And again, the lack of forethought around resources and waiting for others to request those accommodations rather than considering it just part of the way we have any type of checklist to put on an event and we see, and we'll discuss later, differences in marriage and this one pointing out that matchmakers, um, that they found that matchmakers were refusing to work with a person with a disability. Next slide. We saw throughout the open ended also, we asked where are the, where are the examples of successful inclusion and saw friendship circle come out a lot in those responses and we praise the work that they are doing. Um, different things that have happened to accommodate people with mobility issues and make changes to physical structures within the synagogues. And we'll talk about the Zoom and the virtual events in a moment. Next slide, please. Because of COVID, right, unfortunate of COVID, but there has been an increase in these virtual formats. 
And we saw significant numbers, again, with people with disabilities that said that this significantly increased their ability to participate or somewhat increased their ability to participate, right? That's 73% saying that this makes a difference. And this is, again, easy to do in so many circumstances that as hopefully COVID decreases in our communities that we don't lose this piece that's made a meaningful difference for inclusion. Next slide. One of the things that respectability has done for as long as I can remember, but I would say since its inception, is not just to chart where are things going and provide these resources, but also how do we talk about it, right? If you're here today listening to this, chances are that this is an issue that matters to you personally or that you want to know more about. But there, we all have different ways to speak about that in our communities and to our neighbors and our friends to try and increase inclusion. And what matters to us might not matter to the person that we're speaking with. And so looking at not just where do things stand and taking the temperature of the community, but also understanding how can we message this so that more people will care and hopefully increase inclusion and support those efforts. Overwhelmingly, we see a positive message that works, right? We are a stronger community when we are welcoming, diverse, and respect one another. Everyone should feel that their presence and participation is welcome and meaningful. We want our children, parents, grandparents, and friends with disabilities to have an equal opportunity to fully participate in our community. If you take the first choice, right, 58 compared to 15, nine, nine, and nine. And then when you add, if we give them a second choice, totaling 83%, this is the strongest language that we can use to help people understand why this is so important. Next slide. Education levels, when we look at the demographics, were similar between people with disabilities and people not in the, um, not with a disability connection. Next slide. People were um, two times more likely, Jews with disabilities were two times more likely to be single. I mentioned the matchmaking, um, the matchmaking comment that came out in those painful comments. Next slide. And the last, and this is something that we should highlight, and it goes to what Gali discussed in the employment, and is, per, is of particular note because we just showed that the, um, that the education is not different, right? The level of education in this population is not significantly different from what we see with people without a disability connection, but we see big gaps in average household income. So 26% of people with disabilities being at the bottom of this scale and only 6% at the top of it of 200,000 and up. And in red, you can note those differences between people with disabilities and those not in the disability community. Next slide. Lastly, and this is one of those things that follows on that, is the work that we are doing in disability inclusion is incredibly important and meaningful, right? This is a, this is a very personal thing. Your place of worship, faith-based organizations and institutions, but even among people with disabilities, while it is extremely important to them and important overall, jobs, education, and skills, and fighting stigma are, are ranked even higher by people with disabilities themselves as what is so important to them at this point. Next slide. Thank you again to, I won't read all of them, and I know you'll get this, so you'll be able to read it more carefully, but to all of the partners, and those that helped to make this survey possible. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for that. Because time is running along, I'm not going to risk much, so I'm going to turn it right over to Ruben to tell us uh, to tell us a little bit about the exciting work being done at NJHSA. Thank you so much, Matan. And you know, in many ways, um, it's good that this presentation is last because some of the content will pick up on the earlier presentations. 
So um, first, for those who are like initial phobic, NJHSA is the network of Jewish human service agencies. And I'm delighted to be with you today, but what I'm gonna be sharing, I just need to preface, is um, high level and very hot off the press data from a survey on best practice models that our network administered um, in partnership with the Corporation for a Skilled Workforce and respectability. And the reason I say it's high level is that the survey closed just two weeks ago. And we are now engaged in a process of follow-up um, with some conversations with some of the agencies that submitted program models, because you can't always really learn everything fully from a survey. Um, we believe that we need to have some follow-up conversations. That being said, to give you full context, the whole purpose of this survey came out of discussions that bubbled up um, within the job subgroup of the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. The National Affinity Group, which I hope many of you know, is hosted by the Jewish Funders Network <clears throat> and is a forum that was established for funders, practitioners, academics, the media, all to come together and talk about what is going on with the dynamic of Jewish poverty and what are the responses that are underway that are achieving impact, that are truly making a difference. The affinity group divides its work into areas. The jobs area um, spoke over and over and over again about this population as being truly at risk of living at the poverty level or near the poverty level. And it all comes down to jobs and access to jobs. And so I wanna thank the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation that really decided to commission a study and funded the network and the Corporation for a Skilled Workforce to partner with Respectability and design some type of a survey to collect and learn about best practice employment models. So let's go to the next slide. So just um, full context, the member agencies of the network are engaged in a wide range of services, supporting persons with disabilities, their families and caregivers. Um, those services generally are grouped into two areas, residential and also community-based. And when we talk about community-based, it's not just around you know, mental health or employment services, there are efforts underway around self-advocacy, around engaging volunteers and the broader community, and certainly around family support. Next slide. <clears throat> In order to define best practice, this is one of those words that really gets thrown about a lot. Um, and we felt at the network that we wanted to spend some time um, and think about our, our view of best practice um, in the context that these may be program models that aren't always recognized by government or by universities, but they truly are best practice. They are achieving solid outcomes. They meet a demand. They are responsive. They achieve great impact. They're sustainable and they lend themselves to being able to be replicated. Next slide, please. When we looked, used that definition, and we asked agencies to self-identify, think about program models that they administer that support persons with disabilities around employment, we see again a huge wide range, understanding that this population has a very broad continuum. There's a very, very broad group of people that, that may be identified as living with a disability. M models ranging from supported employment to those that are social entrepreneurship, to those that really involve um, government positions through the Ability One program, uh, to those that are apprenticeship or uh, volunteer activities, a wide, wide range. And of course, significant effort around youth and pre employment uh, to address the needs of the transition population. Uh, next slide. 
I'm trying to speak very quickly because I know we're running out of time. So of the data that was received, we received 18 different program models coming from network member agencies all throughout the US, Canada, and Israel. We also received 15 different program models coming from organizations beyond our network. <clears throat> About half of them designed their program model uh, focused on the needs of a particular sector or occupation, healthcare or technology, um, et cetera. Um, probably it's about half use both an individualized and a cohort based model for supporting uh, persons around pre employment. Um, most are using some type of job, job shadowing service about half provide paid internships. And um, a big surprise for many of us, uh, the range of 80% are providing some post-placement job coaching, meaning after the client uh, secures employment, services are continuing. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Just to give you a sense of the range of disabilities, IDD about 38%, learning disabilities about 12%. And on the lower end, uh, those um, that are uh, struggling with a visual impairment or are blind or other type of hearing impairment, those are at the lower, lower percentages. But again, the higher percentages of clients that are being served, IDD, autism, cognitive and, and learning disability. Uh, next slide. Um, no big surprise, I don't think, why uh, most of the ages are between 14 and 24 um, and 25 to 50. Um, and and uh, a nice percentage uh, serving ages 51 to 65. Next slide. <clears throat> and with this, and boy, that was fast. I, I, I just wanted to lift up one organization that submitted a couple of interesting program models. Israel Elwin is a very large agency in our network based in Israel, providing both residential and community-based services for all ages, children, all the way through the elderly and older adults. <clears throat> and you see in their vision statement, they foresee a society in which people with disabilities will be citizens with equal rights, where in which we all aspire to determine our own future and way of life. They're serving over 5,000 people annually. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I mentioned that because um, they have a significant effort around self-advocacy, uh, which is growing um, in this country as well. They administer a large and very successful job placement program, providing on the job support, helping to connect persons with disabilities with a range of positions and also training opportunities. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately they're providing jobs for thousands of individuals um, in a variety of sectors. All of this though, of course, was transformed by the pandemic. As you would imagine, many, um, were finding employment in, in sectors that were closed during the pandemic and are barely reopening now or are, are very, very limited. And of course, we see this dynamic in the states as well. Next slide. So in order to address this, they initiated what they call an open door campaign because they really hold the view that so much of employment focuses and lands around access and stigma and addressing stigma. And in order to make both the candidate, the employee comfortable, as well as the employer comfortable. And you saw some of that in Golly's report and in Megan's report as well. Stigma remains a major challenge. So I just wanna share a super short video clip for their open door campaign. <laughs> בקיצור, <laughs> 
שהגיע לעבוד כאן בליווי עמותת אלווין ישראל. אופית ורבים נוספים משתלבים במקומות העבודה. אבל איך עמותת אלווין ישראל יכולה לעזור לכם, המעסיקים? בואו נגיד שהיא יכולה. יכולה. תסביר להם על ההטבות. שילחצו על הקישור. תסביר להם על מעסיק פותח. שילחצו. תסביר להם על ההטבות. שילחצו. טוב, אני חוזרת לעבוד. הם ילחצו! את תראי! So, so we could spend time analyzing this video, but at the end of the day, this is all about addressing stigma and there is a perception, perhaps held by some, that persons with disabilities don't want to work, are too challenging to have in the workplace. This video, this campaign effort really tries to address that. Um, thought it would be a nice way to end. At the end of my slide deck, which you'll get after this recording, you will see a list of all the programs that submitted their models um, and hyperlinks to learn more about the programs uh, on their websites. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Um, wow, that was so much informative data that we're actually uh, a little further along in the hour than we Uh, had expected to be at this point. We had planned for a very robust uh, discussion of your question. Sadly, our ASL interpreter must leave promptly at 11. Um, so uh, we are going to jump right into some questions. We may be able to stay a little while longer, but we are cognizant of the fact that we lose full accessibility uh, right at 11 o'clock. Um, Uh, we'll plan accordingly. I want to jump right into a question that I feel gets into the heart of what all of us are looking at, which is that um, when we look at the respectability data, we see that only uh, one in five of our respondents can identify um, a leader with a disability. I, I see that someone put it in the chat that they wanted to know the source of Megan's data. The first slide of her presentation and lays that out completely and we'll be providing the PowerPoint deck. So we won't go into it here. Um, but so to say again, whereas Gali's data tells us that when people could do a confidential survey, 7% of employees, that is to say, uh, you know, the same percentage that the federal government targets unsuccessfully for federal contractors are in fact people with disabilities in the Jewish sector. So the question to my mind becomes, and I think it's one that all three of you might have insight into because Ruben, after all your data is looking at successful employment models, is what can we do to change the stigma question? So at the very least, that 7% from Gali's survey uh, become visible and proud in the survey that respectability has done and that maybe the work of the organizations that Ruben is working with gets us from 7% to closer to the one in four adults we know in fact are people with disabilities. So, so who would like to jump first? I, I, I'm happy to jump first. I just want to give a shout out to a phrase that Gali threw into her presentation, which is psychological safety. This ultimately all comes down to everyone feeling comfortable, not only the employee, but the employer. And if leadership, there's a, there's a phrase, you know, the buck stops here. If, if, if the buck or, or the leader of the organization doesn't feel comfortable disclosing a disability, that sense, that value is going to permeate throughout. And I do believe Um, that, that tone of feeling safe is a critical reason why people stay employed where they're employed. And, uh, you know, that's where I think we need to put our energies. Very good. Thank you, yeah, Ruben. Holly, do you and, want and to just to, in? Yeah, yeah. Just to build on top of that, I mean, there, there really, there are three different steps that we see could be successively, you know, building to that vision of the, the kind of representation that we all want. One really starts with some of the basics. I mean, that employee enablement number, in some ways, it's, it's really sad and, and disappointing. In some ways, it's incredibly encouraging because it's fixable. 
we're talking about systems, we're talking about processes, we're not talking about people changing their personalities. These are technical and not adaptive. And that feels like low hanging fruit, which will clear the path and potentially build momentum to the second phase, which I think is, is something that uh, Ruben gestured to is psychological safety. I think there we need leaders to model a certain level of openness of disability, um, awareness, uh, and those types of, of factors. And the third, I think, is, is that learning and advancement piece, which there too, there was some good news. We do have folks who seem to have almost like sponsors, you know, folks who are like, you know what, Matan, you got something. Let me like make sure I can help, you know, clear a path for you, although you don't need help, sir. You know, so it's, uh, it's I, I think that's, there. there's some nuggets here that can really provide a roadmap for that vision. Thank oh. you so much. And I wanted to say, Megan, absolutely jump in but also feel free to pull in jennifer as well for the respectability uh perspective uh on that sure I, I will i will turn that over to her but i think there's an intersection of three different questions that came out of the data that are important on this one is we still clearly see that stigma and prejudice is the top barrier right and we've discussed that and how do we address that one step that was in a positive direction is knowing that disability is now called out as part of diversity efforts within faith-based organizations. But the other part is knowing that the, um, the instances where they're saying, I still don't know how to do this are very high. And there are resources out there and training resources. And I know respectability can speak more to how that um, how that changes. The, the intersection of all three of those, I think, is important to making sure that people feel able to be their full selves and that our organizations know how to best accommodate and be inclusive. I think in Jewish life that what gets measured gets done. And one of the core things is that these studies each used a demographic question mm -hmm. that asked people mm -hmm. if they have a disability or not. There have been many, many Jewish demographic studies, many spectacular studies that have really looked at um, age and background and income and gender and uh, sexual orientation and identity and race, et cetera, et cetera. But all of those studies have left out asking people if they have a disability or not. And so what is especially important about this panel today and why I really want to celebrate it and lift it up is that Ruben's group has done a spectacular study around this and that Gali has done this spectacular study and that the disability demographic was asked. I think if there's one thing that could come out of this um, presentation to really have a starting point is to have a dialogue about ensuring that every Jewish organization that is doing demographics include disability in the demographics that they're doing. So, so spectacular to see over 800 people working at Jewish organizations self-identify that they have a disability. That is massive. That is huge reason for celebration. Um, at the same time, the people are not yet feeling that their accommodations met, needs are being met. Respectability does have a speakers bureau and a training bureau that can help any Jewish organization uh, fix that. Lots of free trainings on that that I put in the chat as we were going along. So this is the beginning. Things are much better by a 65 to one margin. How often do we see that? Not very often, but we still have a long way to go. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, I want to, we are getting really close to the end of our time, especially because Dolly and the interpreter need to leave. So rather than ask another one of the prepared questions, I'd rather give each panelist the opportunity to say, what is one more closing thought you really want to make sure to get in, either regarding your own data or something you noticed when you were listening to your colleagues? I want to give you each like a one minute floor to, to offer a closing thought. And Dolly, since I know uh, you might need to run before our other two colleagues, why don't we start with, with you? Um, Thank you. Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to take a minute. I just want to echo the appreciation and the awesomeness of, of these three studies and really the efforts, the wind at the back of all of them is respectability. And I think that's been a really helped us chart a, a new course. I know I can speak for leading edge 
where you really widen the aperture of the way that we think about the, the ways in which we think about identity and, and belonging really in the workplace. And that's already seeped into a lot of other conversations we've been having and, and thoughts about the field. So just appreciation to everyone on the, uh, the Hollywood squares here so that I see and to JFN as well. Yeah, and I, I just wanna jump in and echo Golly's appreciation. I wanna tell you uh, that what Jennifer said about ask the question, that I think is my closing comment. I think that we have to force our organizations to be thinking about, how, have we asked the question about persons with disabilities? You know, where are we in this space? Where are we in this dialogue? And, um, you know, there, there was a lot in the chat that you all saw about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the sense that this conversation has gotten lost in that conversation. So all of you who signed on for today's webinar, you're, you're motivated to continue this conversation. We want to be your partners um, in helping you to do that. So thank you all. Thank you for being here. So well said. And Megan. So uh, I'll just say also to stay tuned because we have also data coming out specifically in different communities that have been working diligently at this, right? We have we have Houston information coming out, which is a model of a lot of ways that inclusion are working and has been working at it for so long. And so if this was interesting and you want to see more, just know that there is more coming and we will provide that information as well to show what um, what really can be done um, when there are when there's a significant push in the community behind it. And, Indeed, and Jennifer, uh, Los Angeles off, and yeah. Sorry, it's just going to add right, right, Los Angeles, New York, New York Los yeah. Angeles, and the DMV will yeah. all also be um, separately released, which is incredibly exciting. And now I am going to close this, but I am going to say two general thoughts. One is there were a lot of questions in the Q&A box about getting deeper into the data. All of that data will be available for our study from the Respectability website. It actually went live while we were on the call and for Golly's study and Ruben's study released in the early part of 22 uh, and available in more depth. Uh, so you will in fact be able to do those uh, deep dive jumps uh, when the data is released. And I want to remind everyone that uh, when we did our last version of this study in 2018, it launched a massive number of initiatives. So we really do look forward to taking all of this learning and working together for progress. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you to the Mizrahi Family Charitable Fund for making this possible in conjunction with the Jewish Funders Network. And everyone have a lovely day.